there you go, okay, we'll start all again. G'day, I'm Steve Hay, this is Woodworking Masterclass, and this is a stream for Carbotech, the wonderful world of woodworking for Carbotech, and today I'm making native beehive with machines. Before, earlier in the week, I did some um, native bee boxes using hand tools on my channel, and I decided what I'd do with this one for Carbotech, I would use machines. So if you've got machines, you can use machines. If you haven't, refer to the earlier video, and you can make them using hand tools. And yeah, as I said before, if you were good at mime, you would have understood, but if not, I will relay. What's a Saturday morning without technical difficulties? So we've overcome them, and we should be looking good now. I'm looking at that, I've got sound there. And I've got all brand new broadcast equipment and it's still taking a little bit of time for me to get used to it. So let me go in the chat room and I'll, I'll try. Now my mouse doesn't want to work. There we go. Okay. What have we got? No sound. Well, I'll say good day from the top even though I didn't have any sound. Good day, Jared. Good day, Max. Good day, Daniel. G'day, Daniel Mecco from Virginia. Welcome from Brisbane, Australia. Andy, not even gone to bed and you're streaming. Wow. Yeah, it's just one of those things. When I, when I do a carpet tech one, I've got to be on time. Or else Ethel gives me a hard time. Ha! Ah, hope you're all good. <laughs> ah, dear. Charles, g'day. How are you, mate? Good to have you on board. Trevor. Good, why well, isn't Theo streaming today? <laughs> I was talking to him. It was his birthday yesterday. There you go. Lewis, um, g'day, how are you? Hey, Ray, hello. Ben, six knots. See, mate, your birthday's going to, birthdays and Christmas is easy. Just buy machinery and the young bloke will be happy. Um, how do I use this? Oh, oh this is all. We Ah, I find him. I find him. It's good. <coughs> Many nods, good day, mate. Don't give Dad a hard time and don't catch any fish bigger than Dad because Dad's a fragile being and we don't like to be shown up. I know my kids don't watch this, so it's okay. Uh, did, I, did I say good day, Ray? I think I did. Dysel, good day, mate. What a time that teaser is. What a tease that timer is. Yeah, oh, it's, it gives me a breather, I tell you. Oh, and I haven't done this. Wait a minute. I've got, <laughs> I've got to hit record. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I tell you what, time, I reckon time is relevant. It certainly is. You start st screaming. I was going to say not streaming. Start streaming. And that last 10 minutes or so, I woke up. And I had, what's going on there? Oh, that's good. And I, I had heaps of time. Next thing I had 10 minutes. That's it. All going. Lilia, yes, we have, we have sound and Bob might be down. G'day, John. I hope you're doing well, mate. Um, to know. <laughs> oh, dear. All these buttons I have to push. It's, um, Jeffy, I can't hear anything. Is it just me? No, you're right. There was no sound, but I'm back. I'm back. Ah, it's, it's, I'll show you the new screen I'm looking at. Can I? No, it's too hard. I'll show you later. You want to see me make something, you don't want to hear my woes. Mm. Petra Post, is it? Petrosippi Post? Pet! I could call you Pet. Ah, oh, dear. All right. Usually around five million. Good on you. Thanks, Ray. You know me of old. So clearly, no, you didn't miss anything. There was no pearls of wisdom that I put out there. Donald, any beds when he realises it? Echo? Oh, okay. That's when I come. There we go. All right. So I've got to update my checklist. I do have a checklist, but it's redundant now because... The gear that I used to have, I don't have anymore. Ah. Oh, thanks, Jer Jer Jerfy. Jerfy. It's been a while. It certainly has. Ah. 
Thanks, Airborne. Chewy. Oh, wonderful. And catch a live show. It's wonderful to have everyone on too. All right, I'll see if I can find a, a bee box that I've got. Okay. So this basically, we're not making them like this, but we're making one. This is a native beehive for Australian stingless bees. And that's where they go in. And what they do is they build a brood. I'll show you in the book in a minute. They build a brood in there. And it's not like a honeybee. It's not a honeycomb. They actually build the, the Fibonacci. Well, actually, all that Leonardo, Fibonacci. Well, what's the other one? Um, sacred geometry and all that. They, you know, people think someone came up with that. No, nature's had it for ages. And they build this wonderful construction in here that's like the Fibonacci um, uh, what is it? Ah, <sighs> shell. And it goes out and out. And then when they get to a certain height, they then move up into the next box and build in here. And then when that's full, they can go. That's a bit big for a super. Let's see if I've got a super here. Oh, there's a smaller one. They then can go up into the top box and that's where they make their honey or they store their honey and all their pollen for the lean times and the bad weather and what have you. <clears throat> so it's a little bit more involved and we'll do it step by step. But the one I'm going to build and the way I'm going to build it is the way that is suggested. Now, if I can get this going, I'm going to be a happy man. Look at that. And so I've got all new cameras too. This is the native bee book by Dr. Tim Hurd, and I call it the Bee Bible. It's got everything you'd like to know about Australian stingless native bees. And in there, he has well, what we're going to do is going to build, it's called an oath hive, which I didn't know what it stood for, but I've forgotten. So if I read it, you'll think I'm clever. Okay, so this box here we're going to be building. I'll eventually break this down into a smaller video instead of the long stream. So you won't have me dribbling and I'll put the sizes in. And then when we actually get to this stage, there's dividers we've got to put in and uh, inspection windows. So we will get to that all very shortly. Okay, all right, let's go. So the first thing, I'm building these out of western red cedar. A lot of the boxes now are made out of pine. I've seen them made out of hoop pine. I've seen them made out of radiator pine. I've seen them made out of hardwood. I've even seen them made out of MDF, which is, you've got to be careful with that, but it gets painted, or plywood. But it just happens I make bee boxes. I don't make them this way. I make them a, a, a different way. But this is the way Dr. Tim's got it in the book. And this is the way is, I reckon, is the easiest way. So that's why I'm sharing it. So it doesn't matter if you haven't got Western Red uh, Cedar, whatever you can get. What we want is one inch thick, one inch thick timber. These bits I've already machined down because I didn't, I didn't want to waste your time going through the thickness of the jointer. But we've got to rip them to size and then cut them to length. So the first two sizes we have to rip these here that's 90 mil thick the one of uh, sorry wide the one above it is 90 mil wide and the one above that is 65 mil wide we'll dock them to length so let's go over to the rip saw now i'm going to cut these just a fraction oversize i couldn't tell you what 90 mil is, is, in, is in, 90 mil is in inches. I'll give you a rough one. What I've done with these, I have actually resawn them through the bandsaw and I'm leaving this inside rough sawn because the bees like it, whereas humans like it smooth. So I'll go about 91 mil. That allows for a bit of clean up if we need it. Dusty on, sore on.
Push stick. This is a bit that I've already um, got that has been cut to length or, or ripped to length. Now, to start with, the sides are 280 long. So what I'm going to do here is cut them at 290 or thereabouts. And the reason, reason I do that, I want them square and a lot of times you will find that drop saws, the back fence is not super accurate and it can have a little bit of a, a bow in it. So if you cut square here, when it actually finishes the cut, this part will move in and you don't get a square cut. Um, you can, if you're lucky, sometimes fix it, depending on the saw. There are two ends, and we've got to cut. Two shorter ones here. Okay, so that's Turn the dust here. They're the sides, but I'm just going to true them up at the right length and then we'll cut the ends. So I'll just make that there. Move my stop up. Good on me. I'll just move, just move the ruler then too. Okay. When I'm doing um, a production run, I've got things that make this a lot easier. But, at the moment, this will do. Okay. The ends you figure out depending on your width of timber. The overall size is 28 mil long and the width is eight inches. Now, because of the way we're building this with bits of timber going in between the sides, the thickness of the walls that you're making the size out will govern the length of that bit of timber in there. Because I'm using one inch timber, that is two inches 
which means the middle bit's got to be six inches, or in this case, 150 mil. So I'll go and dock those, and then we can start putting them together, but I'll show you some tricks along the way. All right, we'll go back over to the saw, 150 mil. I'm going to true this edge up to start with. Make sure I've got enough. Oh, heaps. Heaps, heaps, heaps. It's another thing to remember to when you're liming a cut up, like I just did then, remember to line it up on the outside of the inside tooth. What I mean by that is, well, I'll get you a blade, I'll show you. That's possibly not a good example. This one would be better. Yeah, so when you're lining up a piece of timber to cut and you've got your ruler there, don't measure it there on the, the saw because you're going to end up short. Measure it on the outside of the inside tooth. And if you've got a trapezoid tooth, measure it at the widest point of the tooth. That way your cut is going to be on the outside of the tooth, whereas if you measure it there, your cut's going to be about half a mil in from where you want it. Just a little trick learned through experience. And when you're putting it up again to stop, make sure you haven't got any dags hanging over like that. Because that will alter the accuracy as well. Okay. So that's it. We're all good to go. Why do I do that? It's it's got an electric brake on the blade, and if I turn it off too quick, it keeps on running. But it's all good now. All right. So we're back. And we have our sides, uh, our ends, and our sides. You can make a very simple box or pencil case using this method. If you can, it's nice to get it in one full length, because then all the timber matches. If not, just work with whatever you've got. <clears throat> now, I've got rough sawn, so obviously the rough sawn goes to the middle and the smooth goes to the outside. You can use clamps on this, F clamps or G clamps, or if you've got a big vise, that will do. But for me, the easiest, cheapest, and most effective way is a rubber band. Just slip it over there like that, and boom, it's in. So just do a, a mock glue up and say, oh yeah, everything's looking all right and they're square and that's okay. And then we can start gluing up. But what I suggest, because this joint we're using, it's called a butt joint, where it just butts up to a piece of timber like that, it's not a very strong joint. The reason being, when you put glue on this end, the fibers will suck all that glue up 
and then when you put it onto that, you haven't got much glue there to give you a strong joint. So I'll show you what you can do to overcome that problem. I'm using a waterproof glue. This one's tight bond. I would suggest you use a water, oh, it's, well, it's waterproof, it's water resistant. As you can see, I'll just put a bit in there. Then I reckon you can dilute it by 10%, but I just give it a few squirts of water. Just get a old brush. I keep here in my bucket. These are just old pastry brushes um, that you can get. They just seem to last forever and ever. And what I do to these joints is I size them or I glue them. And if you have a look, see I'll put a, a lot of glue on that. You have a look, by the time I've done the other side, most of it would have disappeared. This one I'll just do one coat on, like that, I won't do a heavy coat. But you can see it's all covered. Okay, we'll do it to the rest, and then I'll show you how much glue actually stays on top. Uh, this is a good method whenever you're doing anything with end grain, or if you're if you're um, getting your own timber <clears throat> and cutting it down and, and racking it and stripping it out, glue the end grain because that's where all your free water is going to come out of. And if it comes out too quickly, that's when you run the risk of having your timber split, which isn't good. Oh, that one I've just done, have a look. See how much glue's left? It's all been soaked in. And when you're doing an initial glue, that's not a good thing. But when you're doing what we're doing here, wrong one. Oh, doesn't matter. I'll just wipe that off. When we're doing it here, it's a good thing because the glue actually sucks up into the fibers and then dries and once it's dried when you actually go to do the full glue up the fibers have been sealed so you get a much stronger glue bond because obviously there's more glue there to affect the other surface I'm just hoping I've got enough here just to do this last little bit. And there you go. But yeah, if you have a look, that was the first bit we did. There is no glue left. It's all been sucked up into the fibres. So I'm going to leave that for a day to um, dry, but I have got another set here that I glued last night. And yeah, look, this is a different glue, but it doesn't matter. This is hide glue. And the, the reason I used hide glue is because it was on at the time. So it doesn't really matter what glue you use, but it does matter that you size those joints. Okay, put that back in the bucket. Oh, put that in there too. And now we can actually start gluing them together. Where's a bit of paper so they can get glue all over the place. And some rubber bands. These rubber bands, by the way, are size 106 in case you want them. I buy them online. Some stationers, K 
carry them, um, but not all. All right. So I'm just going to... You'll see what I mean when I put this glue on. <coughs> and the other side. Okay, now if you have a look at that, see how much glue sits on the surface? That's because the end grains have been sealed. Make sure you get the right to the right. That can go there, that can go there. Put them on. A lucky band there. One in the middle. And we'll put one on the top. Straighten it all up. And bearing in mind, I am a little bit oversized on this, which is fine because once it's dried, I can then flatten it all off using a block plane or a sander or a sanding block, which I'll show you in a tick. All right. That's your first box joined up. I'll go and put that over here. Let me get a, another bit of paper. If not, I'll put it on the concrete and it'll stick to the concrete, which isn't an ideal situation. <clears throat> so that one I just did then, that's the smallest one, and that's called the honey super, which goes on top. And there's no such thing as too much glue in my book. I would much prefer to have to spend a few more minutes cleaning off excess glue and then spend a lot more time fixing a joint that fell to bits because it wasn't glued properly. This stuff's good too because when it dries it's inert. In other words, it's food safe. One together like that, rubber band, turn it over. These are different colours but that's only because they're different brands. And to get a long life out of your rubber bands, I keep mine in the fridge. I've got some rubber bands in there I've had for five years and they just are still good whereas if you leave them out in the weather or the atmosphere you know after about six months they can start to perish the other thing i like about rubber bands is too it gives you an even pressure and allows you to work within the clamping area whereas if you're using f clamps or g clamps or sliding clamps or scissor clamps you're always releasing the tension on the clamp to do something and if you've only got one pair of hands it becomes a bit tiresome whereas rubber bands allow you the flexibility ha oh, no pun intended the flexibility to move and adjust within the confines of that area There we go, kaboom, kaboom. There's about 20 years worth of glue under that bench. Well, actually not this bench, because I've only had this bench for about eight years. But definitely the bench behind me's got, what would it have? 91, 2001, 2000, it has 30 years of glue on it, there you go. 
Okay, that's a 109, that's too big, don't want that one. And that's a 105, that's too small, it won't stretch. And that 109's too big, it won't have any pressure. So 106, 107's are good. That was a bit loosey-goosey, so I'll just put another wrap on that. Square it up. The more you get it squared and accurate at this phase, the less work you have to do the other end. Alrighty. So that's those. So I've got to leave those for 12 hours or till tonight. So with the magic of television, here's some I did yesterday. So we can keep on going. So when they come out, sometimes they're a little bit uneven. So you can clean that up using a block plane. Or, as I shared the other day, uh, if you've got a drum sander, uh, whack them through a drum sander. If you don't, I don't suggest, you can do it on a linisher, but it's not my preferred option because a linisher, when you're going like this, you can be out just very, very slightly. And what you want is a gap that has no gap. See that join there? That's what you're looking for to have it all the way around, nice and tight, so we don't have any gaps. Because gaps is where the enemies of the bees can get through, the, the pests and what have you. I'll show you a way you can flatten these, which is relatively inexpensive but very effective. Oh, and for those of you, I know I'm butting in streams, but this is a picture frame I did last week. I'll be finishing that off on Monday by putting bow ties and we'll stain it and what have you. So Sunday north of the equator, Monday Australian time. Just the week just got away with me. Okay, now this is just a piece of bench top and I went to a cabinet making shop and I got one of their old used belts. Now this is about a 60 grit. Um, you can get 40 grit and you just put it on there with contact cement and keep it down until it goes off. And then to flatten these things, what you do is you put pencil all the way around. As you can see there, I've just scribbled pencil. I don't know if you can, go. oh yeah, there you go. It's just got pencil marks on it. Now whatever you do, you gotta do the opposite to the other side. So if I'm gonna go three that way, three that way. Turn it 90 degrees, three that way, three that way. Turn it 90 degrees, three that way, Three that way, turn it 90 degrees, three that way, three that way. And then if it's flat, all those pencil marks should disappear. There's a couple of little bits on this, so I'll give them a bit more. If you look at that, that's pretty well all going on. It's a little bit down here. I'm not too worried about that at the moment. But I'll do it because it's going to annoy me otherwise. All right, all right. 
I'm happy now. Okay, all those pencil marks have gone. So I now know that this is dead flat. That's what I'm looking for. Ooh. Now what we move on to is the tops and the bottoms. In this particular one, there's a ply base and there's a ply top. They're one inch is thick as well. And that's for insulation. There you go. Now, sometimes it's hard to get one inch plywood. So what I've done, and I would suggest, I'd strongly recommend, first of all, I'll have a sip of coffee. Where's my coffee gone? That you use waterproof or exterior ply. I didn't have any, so I've just got very cheap internal ply, which I cut up previously. And I cut it two mil oversize all the way around. So if that box is 200 wide, 280 long, I've cut this at 202 wide, 282 long. The reason being, then I can centralize the box on it and I'm gonna have a lip hanging out of the edge that I can plane off at a later stage. Ideally, if you're going to do this and you had some veneer, I would lay a piece of veneer at 90 degrees to the grain. Unfortunately, not everyone has that, so I'm going to do this just the way I'm going to do it now. Make sure your grain matches up. So you've got, that grain's going that way, that's going that way and we glue that straight onto there. Now to give the glue a much better chance of adhering, get hold of some 100 grit or 80 grit um, paper if you have any, or for that matter, if you've got that board that I was just using, rub it a couple of times at 90 degrees to the grain. So if the grain is running this way, run it up and down on that board and it'll give you scratches going down that way. And that will allow a good keying area for the glue to get in. This is a hundred grit. And I'm just going down the face of the plywood. I would have preferred 80 if I've got it, but... And if you can see there, we've got those scratches going down. I'll do the same to the mating surface here. And if you want, you can go diagonally. Because what you don't want is to dead flat, shiny surfaces, because the glue won't stick as well. If you've got a toothing plane, use a toothing plane. I'll do two with a toothing plane. Now, I understand a toothing plane is not a common plane, but here is what one looks like. That will show you if I can... Oh, dear. That's a toothing plane. And the teeth are serrated. 
and the idea of that is it then gives you a lot of scratches instead of a nice straight plane. But that's what it's, ah, cramp, that, that's what it's designed to do. If it's got gnarly bits like that, I always put those on the inside because you can always fill them up and we keep the, the top nice. Generally they're used, or I use mine mainly, if I'm doing a big veneering job and I have to key the substrate, that's what it gets used for. Let me just clear this stuff off. glue those together but I'll have a chat first Craig Art, yeah it's taken a few years for me to build it up but just keep on working away what I find is I buy tools that I need for a job and that way they grow not because oh, I bought all these tools they grew because oh, I did this and I, my carving chisel set I don't know I've got maybe 60 or 70 carving chisels. But I didn't race out and just buy 60 or 70 carving chisel. I was making um, claw and ball feet for, for legs, for tables. So I needed certain chisels for that. Then I was doing relief work for um, splash guards on the back of... <sighs> yeah, Lily, I know so many tricks. The reason being, I've got stuff wrong so many times. And I've had to fix them. Craig Art, yeah, it's taken a few years for me to build it up, but just keep on working away. What I find is I buy tools that I need for a job, and that way they grow not because oh, I bought all these tools, they grew because oh, I did this. And I, my carving chisel set, I don't know, I've got maybe 60 or 70 carving chisels, but I didn't race out and just buy 60 or 70 carving chisel. I was making um, claw and ball feet for, for legs, for tables, so I needed certain chisels for that. Then I was doing relief work for um, splash guards on the back of tables, so I bought stuff for that. And then I had a crack at making rocking horses and I needed uh, more chisels for that. And then I started doing chip work and I needed more chisels for that. And yeah, it just sort of grows. That way you're not wasting your money and if you're smart, the job you're doing actually pays for the tools. Do I ever do any teaching dunking me nuts? Yes, I have in the past and I'm, yeah, I don't know. I might do it again in the future. I uh, have been asked actually by Carbotech if I'd be interested in going up there. So that possibly would be where I do it if I do do it. Um, but at the moment, I'm just having so much fun just doing what I'm doing. Okay, what we'll do, we'll glue these up. And you can just pretend you're a kid making mud pies. Doesn't matter. Um, sometimes I would use 10% diluted glue when I'm doing this. In fact, we might do that on the next one. Uh, this one just came straight out of a bucket. Where's, where's that thing we had? There you go. Uh, that's the number one thing you should always have next to your workbench is a bucket of water. It's amazing how much you use water. And I'm just spreading that out. This is uh, double gluing. 
I will add that this is not highly recommended by the manufacturers, but it works for me. It's just it spreads easier. And by double gluing, I'm putting glue on both surfaces. That way I'm guaranteed I'm getting good coverage. Whereas if you try it yourself, just get two bits of timber, put them together, and only put glue on one, put it in a vise and pull it apart, you'll find the glue is not all over the other piece of wood. So we'll just pop that one there. And we'll do the other one. And then I'll go and put them in a clamp. If you've got a void in there, like I've got a void here, just because this is cheap plywood, just pay a little bit of extra attention and see if you can really fill it up with glue. That will do that. So I'm going to put that back in the bucket, followed by that. And we'll put that over there like that. Score them up nicely. <coughs> really annoys me they don't make 19 mil wide masking tape anymore which I've used for years it's 25 mil it's just too wide what I want but it's all right we'll get by if that's the worst thing that happens to me all week I'm having a good week. Oh, don't you hate it when that happens? There you go. Okay. The reason this isn't sticking is this is baking powder. Uh, baking powder. Stop saying that. Baking paper. So it's greasy sort of stuff. All right, I'm just going to go and put that over in a clamp. And then I shall be back. Because I'm organised. There you go. These two were glued up yesterday. So what we can do now is... Easy part. Pick which one you want as the bottom. It really doesn't make... No, never mind. I don't think. But I quite like this one. So we'll have this one as the bottom. Um, work out which way you like the grain, if you like the grain that way, or do you like it that way, or do you prefer, that? actually I like that, okay, so that's going to be the bottom, that's going to be the front, so I'm going to put that on a base like that. You have a choice, you can either glue it, or nail it, or screw it on. Uh, for me, I'm just gonna put a barrier of glue there. And this so much isn't to glue it, it's to put a barrier up, just in case there are any nasties that wanna get into me beehive. It's gonna stop that from happening. So I'll put that on there, turn that upside down, just mark out where I want to put the nails, one there, one there. Um, if you can, I find it's easier to pre-drill 
where you're nailing because then you can be a lot more accurate with your nails. So there's no guarantees I'm not going to get a split out here, but we'll, we'll do the best we can because I don't want to go up to the other shed. I'll see. I'll just see how easy this nails. There you go. Just make sure I get a bit of overhang all the way around, which I do. If you ever bend a nail when you're hammering, Don't waste your time trying to straighten it because it's just going to bend again. Throw it away. Chalk it up to experience. And move on with life. Now that's, that's the sage advice from the old fella today. Ah, right, see that? Now, if I straighten that and continue to hammer... There you go, bends again, so don't bother about it. If you um, are in a situation where you've got a nail like that and you've got a finished surface, instead of using your claw hammer and pulling the nail out like that, you're gonna bruise this part of the timber, get a bit of sacrificial timber underneath it, then ease it out and that'll keep your surface nice and unblemished. I like to know how those nails got in there, because, anyway. There we go. Bada -bum. Hello, bo- oh! Ah! Oh. Look who's come in. Mine wife. <laughs> You're an embarrassment to the world. I know. There you go. And Bob's come down because he wants some cake. You're not getting any because it's mine birthday and you don't get none. They so come here. Come here. Oh, you, you, you've been working on that one, haven't you? I had. You, you were a rat. You, were, you, you know. There's, for those who don't know on the Carbon Tech channel, this is my lovely wife of... Well, you've been my girlfriend for 44 years and my wife for 43 years yesterday. Yeah. There you go. See? And when I met her, would you believe I didn't have grey hair? So look what she's done to me. Oh, thanks, hon. <laughs> Sam, I meant to eat that. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> that's from me, that's from Adele. Oh, she's a squeedy. <laughs> um, I could eat it, but there's not enough for everyone to have. So I'll just have a little bit. Oh, that's not too favourite. Vanilla slice and caramel tart. Can you go and put that in the fit? Yeah. Now that I've embarrassed the heck out of you. Yeah, and go and stand in the corner. Because <laughs> people say, you going to tell us your birthday? No, I don't care. It's nothing to do with it. No, you're good on you. That's it. My birthday stream now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm officially old today. 66. Oh, at least I don't have to remember too many numbers to write down because it's just the same number twice. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Who is about to be 67 next month? Oh, <laughs> oh dear. That is the base of the box. The next thing we would do is the top. And the top is the thinner one. So again, work out which you like at the top and which you want at the bottom. I like that and I like that as a front. I like that as the front. Okay, so that's going to be the front. That's going to be the bottom, which means the lid's going to go on here. We'll just get some glue. Whew. 
put it there. We'd be finished this if my wife hadn't have come down. <laughs> Bless her. She's a good, she's a good girl. Okay. So this can go there. We turn that upside down. Position it nicely. Ish. Okay. And once more, we'll nail it. Oh dear. Someone once asked me, how do you not hit your fingers? The answer is, hit them. Because once you hit them, you'll decide you don't want to do that again and <laughs> you stop doing it. Uh, Luke is coming up, he's moving back to Brisbane, which I'm very, very excited about, and he wants to have a go at doing some woodwork, which I'm also very excited about. These bruises that are going in the timber with the hammer, the easy way to get rid of them, well, the, the easiest way is you don't put them in there in the first place. But if you spray a bit of water on them, that one might be a bit too deep, I don't know. We'll just leave that. For a bit, we'll come back to that, and those bruises should have gone. All right, so what we've got now is, I've got to trim that off, which we'll do shortly. We've got the bottom brood, the Sunny Hooper, Sunny Hooper. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> the Honey Super. Oh. I, it's good that I catch myself. If I was doing it without catching myself, I'd be worried. Okay, we've got the Honey Super and the Brood Box, and that is those parts finished, except we've got to put an entrance hole in here and a landing stage for them, which we'll do in a bit. But the middle part, we've got to do a bit of work on. That's why I saved it till last. So now we've got to put the Brood Support Bars in which are these things here. And what that does is when you split the box, which means you basically break this box away from this box, that'll have brood in it, that'll have brood in it. And then you put a new base on there and a new mid box on there and the honey super and you've effectively now got two hives. So these straps in here, you can see they're brood supports which are these here. So when you split the box, they stop the brood that's in that section from collapsing into the one below. You can use many things. I've seen people use metal straps. I've seen um, polypropylene, which they used to make chopping boards out of. I just use timber because it's easy. And I've actually got a jig set up. So we'll go over, I don't know what, um, oh no, I might be able to take that camera. Oh, actually, I don't, 
No, we might have to take that camera over. And I'll show you the setup I've got and uh, we'll make those. If you look there where I sprayed that water, see those bruises where the hammer was? They've all come out. So that's the trick. If you bruise timber, providing you haven't broken the fibres, water generally will fix it. Um, so this, again, we've got to look at it and say, okay, which is up and which is down. I like that as down, which means the brood separator is going to go in here. So I'll mark those. And they are a specific distance from the edge of the box. In this case, it's 20 mil, which is just over three quarters of an inch. And the separators themselves are 30 mil, which is about an inch and a quarter. So I've got a jig, as I said, uh, said on the router um, that's set up. So I don't know if I've got the right bit in there. Let's get a camera over there and we will have a look, see, and then we can do all that as well. See, split a bar jig made on the 26th of August last year. Okay. And we'll get the box. That will do. To do this, I put that in the end and then I actually slide that into the box. And it will get it so it's the right side up, which is that side. Okay, dusty on. Router on. Take it up the other end. Turn that off, and that's given me the recesses I need for these bars to go in. Now the other thing we've got to do is put a brood excluder in. What that is, is this portion here. And it goes over here, so, well, there's a better picture of it there. It prevents the bees from going from here to here to here before they've actually filled this box with brood. Now, what you can do, you can just put a bit of plywood there, and that's, that works perfectly fine. Or you can use um, perspex. I use polycarbonate because I, I have some. Very, very strong, won't break, but it's clear. But the joy you have with using this is you get to see the bees working, which is fascinating. You watch them building the brood. Eventually, they will just cover this in the material that they produce and you can't see. But while you can, it's just a fascinating uh Hey, pastime, I, I can sit there for, and I literally do, I'll sit there for an hour just watching them. The, uh, one of my hives I've just opened the honey super up to, which means now unfortunately I can't pull the box apart to watch them. But up until that stage, gee whiz, you know, when it's cold, there's not much happening. And then when it hits about 24 degrees or something, rather they're all flying around and busy on the inside. So that's what we've got to do now is put a brood separator in. And we'll go back over to that camera and I'll show you how I do that. Again, I've, I use the same jig, but I've got a different setting on it and it works slightly differently. So the um, stuff I use is only one and a half, no, it's one mil, one mil um, thick. So I just bring that 
up to the one mil mark, which should do there. Lock that off. Now I've got to work out which is the front and which is the back. I'll just take those dags off as well because that will prevent me from getting a, a clean cut. The bit I'm using is a, a rebate bit. Um, which is, whoops, that. So it's got a bearing on there and it just cuts out a, a rebate. This one's got a smaller bearing, which gives me a bigger rebate. Um, I looked to the front to see which one I want people to see. That's quite nice. So I'll have that as the front. So what I want is the brood separator to have an opening here. So what do I do in that case? I put this down this end and then route out around, which we will do. Whoops, get it up the right way. There you go. Um, so I'm going to go this way. We go in there and we go around. Righto. <laughs> Check to see if that's deep enough. To me, it feels it could be a little bit deeper. It doesn't matter if it is a bit deeper because the, um, yeah, I might just go a fraction deeper. The bees will fill up any gap that's there. But if it's not deep enough, then you don't get a good seal and um, predators can get in there. Beautiful. Okay. So let's put these in. All I do, just a little dab of glue, just a slight amount. Pop them in. Now you can nail them in, or you can just leave them like that. Personally, I like, I like just putting a nail in, or in this case, staples. Hang on to your hat. There you have the brood separators. And then the top. This is a bit that's been kicking around the, the floor for a while, so it might be a bit scratched. But you'll get the idea. It's a little bit tight there, so I'm just going to plane that off a bit. Where's my plane? I'll just smooth this one out too. Fitting there pretty all right. I 
that fits in there like that, what we'll do will take this off. And we'll just nail that in. So that now gives you a nice clear inspection window. All we got to do now is put a vent hole in the back. I want a quarter inch hole for the vent at the back and I uh, again because I make a lot I have a jig made up that I use and I'll measure it let you know the measurement in a minute but that just sits on there Now this is reasonably important, what I'm doing here. This is a vent hole. In case it gets really hot, it allows the hot air to escape, which keeps the hive cool and stops them from dying of heat exhaustion. But a lot of times the, the bees will just fill it up. But if I drill it straight in like that, what happens is when it rains, Water can get in, and water is not good for the beehives. So I do mine at about a 15 degree angle upwards. Now bear in mind, this is the top. So I'm doing 15 degrees upwards, which still allows for the vent, but doesn't allow water to get in. I'm just putting a bit of backing behind there, because I don't want it split out. So now that hole, see if you can, see you can't see that, but if I tilt it, then you can see through. But if we go straight on, the rain won't get in. And by using that bit of block underneath, I minimized the tear out of um, the grain on the other side. It's a little bit there, but not too much. Now with the bottom, which is this one we've worked out which is the front this is the front I might just we might just plane this a bit flatter uh, I could take it out and put it over the buzzer or the jointer or whatever you wish to call it but I'll just oh, let me see let me see let me see uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, just we might just play it. Okay, what is my block plane? A bit of grease on that. There 
as I said, I would prefer to use external ply. This is internal. But, um, nah, I'm going to take it over the saw and muzzle. Go old school. If you've got a table saw, I'll take the other ones off on the table saw, but if we've got two square edges. It's going to be easier. Nearly there. Now for the hole, for the bees to go in, I use a half inch, where are we, a half inch force and a bit, but it's the same deal. You start your hole and then 15 degrees. Or thereabouts. Put something behind it. So we've got that if you look straight on. Let's see if we can. You can see it goes up. And by putting that block behind it, we don't get ugly tear out. So we're almost there. Um, might just go over in the saw and clean these two edges up. Where's the owl? Oh dear. Bear with me, I'll just knock these ones down too. There's a Spray gun. Sorry if I'm ignoring you in the chat. I don't mean to, but the idea with this one is to do the project. But I will catch up with you shortly. these block planes. This one's a uh, Veritex DX60. <laughs> but no matter what plane you have, just make sure it's sharp. Because you could have the best plane in the world and if it's not sharp, it's not going to work for you. Okay, so that one. So I should, I was going to trim it on the saw, but 
Well, tell them to go over there and do it. The most will do this. And I think it's good if uh, every opportunity you get, if, if, it's your, if it's your bag to be used in hand tools, every opportunity you get, have a go at using a saw or a chisel or a spug shave or a hand plane because then when you actually come to use them because you really need to, you're going to be just that bit more familiar with it, practiced with it. And as I've said many times, save a fortune on gin, please. Get a hand plane work with that for 15 minutes. Good cardio workout. Your arms get it, your wrists get it, your tummy muscles get it. Okay. There we go. Oh. And, and for us old people, it's good for the memory. Okay. Ah. Done that. Done. Okay, we go over the saw, cut these to size. And then we'll put the landing stage on and then I'll show you another couple of little things you can do. A little bit of hit and miss here, but there we go. box is out a little bit which is my fault I didn't check it it's obviously not square because I know the boxes are square but that's okay I'll finish these off with a block plane fingers give you feedback to you. It's more sens sensitive than any instrument you can buy from the shops.
starts to grab, put a bit of candle wax on it. Got to put a, a step on it or a landing stage. Landing stage, what I use, okay, if I can find them, is uh, just a square bit of timber, three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch, and 70 mil long. Here we go. I've got them, and everything fell down. That'll learn me. That'll learn me. So you get one that matches the colour of the thing if you want. That's quite nice. I'll pop it there. And you want it so it's um, a little bit lower than the entrance to the hole. And when I put my screws in, I don't put them in a straight line. The reason if I do, if I put pressure there and there, it can split all the way along. So even though it's asymmetrical and it'll drive people, the OCD, up the wall, that's the reason for it. You have them offset, that way you won't split the timber. So let's just... Drill a hole and we'll stick a couple of screws in there. And we should be good to go. And bear in mind when you're doing clearance holes. It doesn't matter. In fact, you want them bigger than the um, screw you're actually using. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go down deeper. I'm just going to be this one here. Or will I? Yep. I could countersink these, but I actually like going down a bit deeper. And then I can fill it up. A lot of times I'll use wax or um, just wood putty. But that way you don't get the screws exposed and it doesn't look as bad that's pretty darn close to be in the middle I think Up to there Up to there I'm not going to lose any sleep over that hold it tight screw and I'm sure the bees don't mind if it's if it's not dead square that's just the, 
the human element coming into play. Now you can either, as I said, fill that with wood putty, or I, a lot of times I'll just use beeswax, which I might even do now. If, if, if I can find it. Um, I don't, oh, there, there it is, there it is, there we go. And this is all I do, nothing too high tech. This is beeswax in this jar. This is a heat gun. I just put it in there. And there you go. So we've got the super, we've got the middle box, and I'm just waiting for that honey to go off, uh, that beeswax to go off. Um, show you another couple of things you can put on there to keep it off the ground. <laughs> Is these nylon nail glides. Pick them up, hardware shop. And you pop these. four corners see that's glossed over quite nicely I can get some space there you have successfully what was that two hours with me talking and getting embarrassed by my wife you've made an oath beehive that native bees would absolutely love to be in. Now, to keep it all together, I just make these straps up. Uh, it's just a webbing strap. Goes over there like that. And eventually the bees will seal the joints between the boxes but before they can do that, if you've got a nice strap, it holds them firmly together. If you've got those good, nice, flat joints that we spoke about, nothing can get in there. And I've got a handle on mine, so I can just pick it up. And that actually will be going out into my garden and house another hive of bees. Now I'll show you, this is one that I, I hope it's dry, how to come overcome some of the problems that that box represents. The biggest problem with timber, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the stream, when we were sizing those edges to butt join them, is the end grain. Now I understand if you uh, are using pine or something, and a lot of people do, they paint the entire thing, and that's fine. If you're using internal plywood like this is, definitely paint it with a good quality outside enamel paint or acrylic paint, because you don't want the weather getting to it. They do have roofs that go over the top, but that's another um, area that we'll cover in a, a later video. But if you wanted to keep, uh, we've got in here, but just up in the other shed, it is too. If you wanted to keep the timber look, 
and you wanted to oil it, I'll just oil it with a bit of this. I use boiled linseed oil in, in most cases. The only reason is it dries quicker than raw linseed oil. This is mineral oil, but if you put that on, you can see just how lovely that timber comes up. And you might want to keep that color. If that's the case, oil it. But on the end grain here and on the top, paint it because this will eventually dry out unless it's protected in some way or other. What I've done with a, a box, this is the one I handmade, um, what was that? Monday or Tuesday, I think. And I've just painted just the end grain because I want to keep the timber uh, in its natural state and oil it. And I think it took more time masking it up than it did to actually make the thing. But what you can do is get a little bit artistic with it. And this uh, colour here is Brunswick Green. And all I've done is just painted the parts that are exposed. I'll get all this stuff off. Quite excited to see how this is going to look actually because I, I only painted it yesterday. Uh, it's a um, an enamel paint. Well, there's another couple of things I'm going to talk about too in a minute. In the uh, book that Tim wrote and the one we just made, the major difference between mine and that is if you look on that inspection plate or viewing platform, it goes to the end, which there's a bit of a gap there. You can see that poking up. Now the bees will eventually fill that, but you can also run into a bit of problems with um, water getting in there if you get sort of horizontal rain. Whereas the one I do, which you saw me do then on the router, I actually bring it back. So it's sealed on the timber. The bees will still come in here and fill that up, but it waterproofs it um, a fair amount. So that's yeah, something you might want to consider. Now we'll just take this one off. I don't know if this is the top or the bottom or what. Oh, this, is, this is the bottom. Boom, boom, boom. And yes, I know I haven't sprayed the bottom of this, but I'm going to put something else on the bottom because it wasn't going to waste me good green paint because you don't see the bottom. And yes, I suppose I could have had all this done before I went on air, but sometimes it's nice to see something actually done in real life. And the other thing is, if I've stuffed it up, you get to see that too. A bit like car racing. Everyone goes hoping they see a crash, but hope they don't. 
Uh. Well, I've got to tell you, I'm reasonably happy with the way this is looking. And I, again, I do apologise, I haven't been shatting. Do the where'd the top one go? Here we go. This one also will house some bees in my yard. So I, I just hope there's no jealousy amongst the hives. One going, how come yours is painted and yours isn't? We're nearly there. Might not be the best paint job you've ever seen in your life, but the good thing is all this end grain here has been sealed with paint. The plywood on the top has been sealed, all around the edge has been sealed, the edge has been sealed there. As I said, I'll do something differently on the bottom. And then if you want, you can oil the outside. It doesn't matter if you put oil over the paint, then you get that really nice timber look. Might as well do the all three sides. Do this one too so you can see that. Um, I would normally use boiled linseed oil, but it's up in the other shed and I'm not going up there. There you go. And what I was saying about the inspection panel, when you lift that off, you've got tape across here and you get to see what the bees are doing in here and this is taped off. When this is full, then you take that tape off, put this on, put a, um, uh, a strap around it so nothing can get inside and the bees will eventually seal that. There's one more thing I haven't done, which I shall do now. And that is, if you're going to be splitting your hives to make it easier to get the tool in, and I did have, I did have the tool here on me, oh, here you go. Right, this is a hive splitting tool and it's available from sugarbagbees.net, which is Tim Hurd's um, website. So you've got this set up like this, and you've made really nice tight joints. Very, very hard to get this in here to break it open. So to enable you to do that, just grab your block plane and give it, I don't know, half a dozen, whatever, at an angle on the corner. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That'll do. One, two, three, four, five, six. That'll do there. One, two, three, four, five, six. That'll do there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight. Because I felt like it. And on the back of the super
we've just taken that corner off. So all the way around, it's got a corner taken off. Now that enables, when you want to split your hive, it's going to be all glued up with what the bees glue stuff up with. Because you've got that chamfer in there, that knife will fit in there like that. And then you can get in there and leave the box open. The same with the back up here. You can get in there and leave the box open. So that's just a, a little thing that makes it easier if you're down the track, if indeed you're going to split hive. Well, there you go. We got there. I'm going to have a chat now because I've been so rude. Thank you. Uh, do, do, do. Does the edge of the plywood or sand much different from regular wood? Uh, yes, it does. The reason being, when plywood's made, it's at 90 degrees. So you've got one sheet of ply one sheet of veneer going that way, and then one sheet going that way, and then the top sheet. And if you look at plywood, it's always uneven numbers. It's either three ply, seven ply, nine ply, eleven ply, because the two matching outside pieces have to be the same orientation. So it does sand a bit differently. It definitely planes differently because while you're planing, you're planing long grain and short grain at the same time. That's another reason you've got to have really, really sharp tools, especially with plywood. And it will blunten your tools quicker because of the glue that they use. A lot of the time it's a, a resourceful formaldehyde-based glue, which is very, very tough on blades. So I hope that one helps you. G'day Jose from Texas. Welcome from Steve in Brisbane. Bella Dinosaur, glad to catch up. It's been a while, it's lovely to catch up. Look at that, I, I've missed it. If there's any questions that anyone's asked while I was busy, please ask them again. I'm quite happy to stay back and answer any questions you may have. Those uh, bee boxes, they're not, as I, where's one of mine? Mine, if you look at mine, they're built differently. I actually have worked out a way that there is no end grain showing whatsoever. So I know they're safe. Here's one that I literally threw out in the yard, um, would have been seven, eight, ten months ago. And it's been in the yard, just lying on the grass with the rain and the sun. That part I knew would fail. And so I've finished or worked out another way of doing that so that doesn't happen. But if you look at the joints, they have not moved one bit. And they've been submerged in water. They've had 42 degree heat put on them, all sorts of things. So I'm very, very happy with those. Although I'm, I'm happy with the ones I've just made. And if you're making them for yourself, they will work fine. But just be very mindful of that end grain because that's the bit that's going to bring you unstuck. All right, that's about it. Well, I will be streaming Monday or Sunday where I will finish off this um, picture frame that I made last week. That was all done with hand tools, namely H&T Gordon molding tools and no Bex saws. So I'll finish that off. What I'm going to do here, because it's not splined, I'm going to put butterfly joints or bow ties in there. So I'll show you how to do that and make those by hand. I will also unveil the new toy that I've got, which is absolutely exciting. And if you've got any requests, please, if you like what you're seeing, please subscribe to the channel you're on. And if you want to know more or you're interested in tools and you're on my channel, please go onto the Carpetech uh, YouTube channel, C-A-R-B-A-T-E-C dot com dot A-U. And um, if you've got any questions you would like them for me to do a video on, let them know or email me directly and we'll get up and running because they're getting a, a great um, storage of different people 
doing a lot of different sorts of woodwork. Next week, I believe, Olivia is going to be on doing uh, wood carving. I don't know what she's going to be carving, but if you're interested in wood carving, check out wood carving, check out Carbotech YouTube. Next Saturday, she's doing a live stream and she's a very, very talented carver and a lovely person to boot. I spent five minutes for two hours having a chat with her the other day. So, Olivia, good luck with your stream next week. If you're on Facebook, please, Give us a like if you're on whatever I said, yeah, YouTube, hit the subscribe. Uh, appreciate everybody's attention, interest and kind thoughts. Thanks for the birthday wishes. I'm just going to go up and thump my wife with a very, very soft sponge, I will add. So it won't hurt her, but she'll get the message. Only happens once a year. So thanks for all the anniversary good wishes and the birthday wishes. Uh, and for your attendance, for the moderators, for being there. Uh, new people that haven't been with us before, thank you so much and I hope to see you again. If you want to know anything, you can email me at admin at woodworkingmasterclass.com.au or woodworkingmasterclass at gmail.com or carbotech.com.au um, and the messages will get to me. But in the meantime, that's it. I've got my bee boxes. I'm going out to see my bees. And then when I get a new lens for my camera, I will take some shots of them and you can do that. In the meantime, thank you all. And this is me pulling the shed door down and saying, remember to keep it sharp and more importantly, keep it safe. Look after yourself, enjoy your craft. And if you get bored, get creative. If you're in a situation where you have regulations on you, find something that makes you happy because the regulations will pass. And when you find something that makes you happy, it might be something you want to do in the future. So till then, look after yourself, be kind to each other, catch you all later. Thank you so much. Bye for now.